Finally today, the second part in our conversation with Hollywood story analyst Michael Sweeney, in which he speaks about his time at Taylor Sheridan's 101 Studios, his thoughts on AI and screenwriting, about how the streamers have impacted on screenplays. My first question, the question on everybody's lips, how to break into Hollywood? Think outside the box, because that's only going to strengthen you as a writer. It's going to show you adversity that's going to contribute to your voice in and what you feel passionate about in terms of the content of your of your stories. Like the best example of this I know is that, um, you know, a bunch of voice actors decide to form a Dungeons and Dragons based YouTube channel called Critical Role, which I some of your viewers may be uh, familiar with. And they play this super nerdy game where they play pretend and generate different story arcs with these characters that they they just speak into existence. And then all of a sudden, it's an Amazon Prime uh, top rated uh, animated TV series that um, I believe is has been renewed and, and um, is going strong. I just think that there are so many projects and so many uh, different things that are coming from people who started off in different digital landscapes, or there's, you know, uh, podcasts, there's YouTube channels, there are sh- uh, uh, shorts and and um, short series that people produce on their own and post different video platforms that, you know, kind of kind of goes around Hollywood in a way. And then once they're popular enough, then all of a sudden, oh, now we want to make it. Now we want to create a TV show. Now we want to do this. Now we want to do that. So it's sort of, you know, flying under the radar and then popping up at your strongest and then it'll kind of get you around the roadblocks and hopefully ideally um picked up and produced by somebody how do you manage that analytical versus the creative brain because a lot of people i know who are readers they sort of lock up when they have to be creative uh, because there is all these rules going through their mind um have you had that issue ever when you're writing a script that you feel very passionate about because of like it's it speaks to your voice, your perspective, I at least like to kind of abandon all of the rules because once I have the script written, then I can use my analytical skills to go back and say, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, this isn't right, that's not right. Oh, this is actually a really good scene. And then sort of work my way back through. So like, you know, the 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 analytical brain is for when a script is all said and done. But when a script is in motion and it's in the process of being created, there are no rules. And I do this with my with um, analysis with, with clients as well. Even though I'm using my analytical brain, when it comes time to speak to them about their scripts, I never say that there's anything set in stone. I never say they can't do anything. I warn them of the pitfalls and the traps, but I tell them if you want to keep this element, I would suggest this. If you want to keep this flashback, then understand the audience is going to think this. If you imply this, the audience will expect you to do this. And that's sort of how I bridge the gap between um, analytical and and creative. Um, You have to keep your objectivity. And um, I know that you've worked for a while for 101 Studios, and that's where you got to read the work of Taylor Sheridan. What was it actually that you that you got to read at the time? I had the opportunity to read um, the entirety of all ten. I believe there were ten scripts, all ten scripts of Mayor of Kingstown before it was ever released, and so I knew the whole story of season one before it even came out. And a lot of what Taylor Sheridan does, and a lot of the notes that I sort of gave, and just sort of like kind of little guiding notes, because most of it was about giving the production team a sense of we want to know the story so the comments were not very intense because taylor sheridan did not want the comments to be very intense because he knows what he's doing and he's been nominated for an oscar and who am i to tell him what to do but i did kind of emphasize like hey i kind of lost this character a little bit in this script or like i i got confused as to what was happening because we're cutting back and forth so much and sort of things that just sort of like I wanted them to know, and they could sort of do what they needed to do from that, Um, especially because 
the the nature of a show like Mayor of Kingstown, it won't be until you read episode eight that you realize, oh, that's why that didn't make sense to me. And that's why that did. But again, really prolific and established writers have the privilege of doing that. You as a writer, if you send me a pilot and I have the same questions, I might not be as be as generous. If that had not been Taylor Sheridan, how would you respond to the twist without giving the detail of it? Well, I would have Again, it's so hard without actually spoiling it. It's, <laughs> it's the whole, it's the it's the psycho logic where you uh, when Hitchcock made Psycho and you see that blonde woman, you assume, oh, the movie's about her. Not so much. If that packs a punch, it does not matter if you are a new writer because considering it's a pilot, you end that pilot with someone way out of their depth having to reel over the death of somebody important to them and having to then take on a certain mantle, that is exactly what you want to do with a pilot. So it's not that you need to do that in the pilot, but you need to make sure that your reader and thus your audience is compelled to watch next week and find out what happens next. And a twist like that, again, always my disclaimer, if done well, is a great way of, of hooking the reader. When you read material that you know you that is going to get made, that's slight that's slightly different, right? It it definitely is because I'm thinking about like we're going to have Timothy Chalamet and Saoirse Ronan reading for these two parts. You instantly start reading it with those actors in mind. You're hearing their voices. You're hearing their inflections. You're hearing their tone of voice, which also kind of shifts the way that you look at the script. Um, because as unfair as it might be, there may be a script that's like pretty decent. But if you don't hook the reader, they're reading that at a mile a minute, giving their assumption, giving their uh, um, analysis, telling the, the client or company it's your genre, it's your niche or it's not. And then it gets and then it, you know, gets discarded. So it's it's very it's it's not easy. And there are a lot of things about it that are very unfair. And that's why. There are parts of reading for production companies that I like more than um, more than other forms of coverage, but there's other instances where I like working with clients because it's not so demoralizing and 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 dejecting and feeling like I'm denying someone's voice from being from being heard. What's the best script you've ever read in terms of craft? All right, I have I have two. One of them I read because. He was meant to be the sole writer of Toy Story three before I think he dropped off the project, or, or it was it was a matter of uh, a collaboration that they had, that they had done. Um, but I love the Little Miss Sunshine script. Michael I think Arndt. that it's and look, yeah, exactly. I couldn't think of his name, Michael Arndt. Fantastic screenplay to a fantastic film as well. You could see how it translated from from script to screen. But I also read the Avengers script. And I realized that not not thinking that the movie was like I I loved the movie uh, of course, but to to look at a superhero movie and kind of call it prestige, especially at the time before it was really prestige. Reading the script, I realized just how seamless and flowy the dialogue was, how simple but very visually impactful the the action the the action lines were because you'd think that there'd be pages upon pages of like of of text but it's really not it's like it it managed to be both a blueprint but like so much was said in the action lines than what was written like every single sentence packed a punch you didn't need this long flowy description of the of the nope no just simple and again it was Josh, Josh, Josh Just Whedon. Whedon. Just Whedon. So he, like, so it's not surprising to me, but it was very much like, in terms of two scripts that are completely different, I think those two are the ones that jump to uh, jump to mind uh, first. Yeah. What's the biggest unproduced project that you ever read? Was that Mayor of Kingstown or was it something else? I mean, I would say, I mean, Mayor, Mayor of Kingstown's a, a big one. It's probably hmm. the, 
one of the better ones. Um, I, I read a script by, I read a, a Sorkin script that was, I believe it was, it was the, the, the trial of the Chicago seven. Mm -hmm. And I read that before it was produced and I was kind of reading through it. And I was wondering how it was going to work as a film because it was very long, even for Sorkin, it was long. And I thought, could he do this for, for TV? I'm interested to see who picks this up because somebody probably will. And lo and behold, Netflix did. And I, I, I caught most of it. I didn't watch the entire thing, but I, as I was watching it and you can even see it through the trailer, you see like, Oh no, this is a, this is a self-contained story. This was, this is when I first started out at 101 studios. So even at the time I was still sort of learning um, when it came to um, when it came to script reading, because they were really the first company that truly took me on specifically to be a reader. Um, so it was interesting to see like how my perception of that kind of um, I still stuck to my guns, but how it kind of changed, assuming it would be it would work better in this sense, but then realizing, no, oh, no, 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 they were right all along. No, like he Aaron Sorkin knows what he's doing, you know, so. How do you see the future of screenwriting in the context of developments as ChatGPT and, and so forth and Sora? You can't really replicate the human voice with with AI. And, you know, I'm I'm wary of it. I know that it's going to become more of a tool in the future for writers to use as it becomes more advanced. I personally, and I hope everybody else in any guild would fight on the picket lines to make sure it stays a tool. I had a question from Clive Hopkins. Is the rise of streaming services changing the way we tell screen stories? I think so. A lot of pilots that I read don't have act breaks anymore. And a lot of stories like allow, a lot of writers allow the stories to speak for themselves. And at times, like you can kind of tell where the act breaks would have been, but there's no need to break because they don't take a break in the action on streaming, you know? So why, why do it in your script? Um, and I also feel like uh, whenever I watch an ABC show, you can just tell by the look of it, it's an ABC show. It's glossy. All the fantasy shows on there, Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder. There's something glossy about the look of it, you know? And then same thing goes for like, you had the NBC workplace comedies. And then you have a very specific kind of comedy with CBS when it comes to kind of sticky, you know, Big Bang Theory, uh, uh, Two Broke Girls, Mom. Like the, there's a lot stricter of a style that each network has because there's an expectation that all these shows are going to be just like the shows you've watched before on this channel. But when it comes to streaming, they give you so many options that when people say, oh, this would be good for this streaming service or that streaming service, sometimes I think it might work for a, dip, a bunch of different kinds. Like there, there's so much versatility. There's people who would want to watch a really deep drama about crime but it doesn't mean that an anime show wouldn't be equally as popular. It's just the people who like those shows would all flock to those shows. So both shows get their viewership, both shows get to continue on, and we're all the better for it by having more content, especially from a television standpoint, um, to indulge in. Almost at the end of this, Michael, it's been fantastic. But I wanted to know what are you writing on right now? Do you want to share that with us? Um, I am working currently on a a project that it's a, a an hour long pilot that is a it's an adventure mystery blend that it's called it's called Hours. Um, and Hours is an acronym for the secret society that is central to this story called the Omnipresent Underground Repatriation Society and. Basically, what the group does is they reverse Indiana Jones artifacts of cultural significance, intrinsic significance that basically were victims of imperialism that are kind of held in places where they really don't belong. And, you know, the the group in the story swaps them out with identical replicas very stealthily to repatriate them back to where they deserve to be. And basically, the 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 premise is a lot more personal than that, though, because I have um, created an antagonist, a billionaire named uh, Ava Bauman, who 
essentially is imperialism personified. Um, imagine if Miranda Priestley from Devil Wars Prada became uh, a Tomb Raider, essentially. Um, that's who she is on the inside. But on the outside, she is a well-respected philanthropist. She's a dedicated member of the community who boasts her personal collection that she wants to share with the world. And the dark side of her is the version that the leader of this secret society knows very well. And this enigmatic figure called Ab named Abigail, Abigail Flynn, um, she not only seeks redemption for her contributions to kind of raiding people's cultures, but also retribution for a betrayal, a deep betrayal that ruined her. Um, but standing in her way is the protagonist of the story. Her, her name is Annie Anderson. She is a security guard who takes her job way too seriously. She is devoted to this billionaire because it's, it's, she basically gave her a job. She gave her a home. Like she, she feels that she owes so much to her. So at, at its heart, this story is going to be about reclamation reclaiming what belongs to people that has been stolen and reclaiming your own sense of self from in Annie and Abigail Flynn's perspectives, what has been taken by Ava, that they now have to reclaim for themselves. Well, if you had the magic wand, who's going to star in it and what's going to be the date and the place where it's going to premiere? I thought about when it came to, um, when it came to Ava, I mean, I would love for it to be Meryl Streep. I know TV shows, as far as like a premiere of a TV show, I mean, I, is the Chinese theater too greedy? I mean, I'd like, <laughs> that That would be great to premiere to the Chinese theater. Um, but yeah, yeah. So lofty goals, but, uh, but hope, uh, I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> If you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe to the channel? We have tons of videos about story, script, pitching, and selling. And if you're about to write a draft of your own, check out the Immersion Screenwriting Courses. They're the perfect primer for great contemporary screenwriting style. Thanks for watching, and um, happy writing. Cheers.